Meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made by Boston City TV, a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications, and is being broadcast on Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Fios Channel 962. With that, I hand it off to our board chair, Wesley Ireland. One moment for the interpreter. Wes is saying just one moment. I'm setting up my screen. Okay, great, I'm ready. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is uh, having a great summer so far. I guess we're just gonna go ahead and get started with the uh, introductions of the members. I guess I will start by saying I'm Wes Ireland. And uh, you can see me using sign language and there's an interpreter who is interpreting from my sign language. I'm the chair of um, the commission and I live in the North End of Boston. So now I'd like to recognize Josia to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Wesley. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Dusia Lubovskaya, or Dusia L for short. And as Wesley mentioned, I'm the vice chair. And I am in Boston, specifically in Mission Hill. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Dusia. I think we will ask for uh, Carl to introduce himself next, please. Hello, everyone. This is Carl Richardson. I live in Brighton Center, and I identify as a deaf-blind individual. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Carl. Next, could Paul introduce himself? Hi, my name is Paul Karen. I serve as the Disability Advisory Board Secretary. I work at the BPDA and a, and a Boston resident. Thank you. And how about um, Harley, sorry, Yardley? Hello, everyone. My name is Yardley Sanchez. I am a board member and I reside in Dorchester. Great. Thanks, Yardley. And next, uh, Elizabeth, please. Uh, yes, I'm Elizabeth Jean Clower. I'm a board member and I reside in Bath Bay. I also wanted to let you know uh, that, that um, Elizabeth is going to be our uh, special um, advisory board member spotlight this evening. So. so now, uh, next, I let's see, who's next? Who's on the phone? Oh, Jerry. Hi, yes, I'm Jerry Boyd. I'm an advisory board member and I live in West Rockford. Thanks, Jerry. And is there anyone else here who has not introduced themselves? Okay. Andrea, I have a question for you. Do we have a quorum this evening? Yes, we do. We have seven members, which is a quorum for our, our total seats of 13. Great. I'd also like to add um, that the Com Commissioner McCosh is not going to be with us this evening. So Andrea is going to be uh, in place of the Commissioner for this evening. So thank you, Andrea. All right. So now uh, let's go ahead and approve the June minutes. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the June minutes? 
I make a motion to approve. This is Carl. Okay. Does someone want to second that? I second that. Is that Yardley for the interpreter? Yes. I'm Yardley and I second Carl's motion to approve the minutes. Great. Okay. All in favor, please say aye or raise your hand so I can visibly see you. Aye. 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 Okay. I think that was everybody. Thank you. The motion passes. So the minutes have been accepted. Okay, now uh, for this evening's presentation, we have a presentation on the MBTA bus network redesign. <coughs> and we have with us uh, Victoria Ireton. So, um, Victoria, you can have the floor. Hi, folks. I will be filling in for Victoria today. My name is Doug Johnson, and I'm the project manager for bus network redesign. I'm also joined by my colleague, Robert Guptel, the Director of Service Planning at the MBTA. I will share my screen, so please give me one moment. Can... Joe, can you hold for one second? I'm sorry, is it course. Robert or Joe? Joe. Uh, this is Doug speaking. I'm so sorry, Doug. This is the interpreter. I mis misunderstood your name. I just need to set my screen one second. No problem at all. Thanks so much. One moment, the interpreters. We're just making a switch. Esther's going to interpret this part. I'll make sure we can find her. And she's spotlit. Oh, sorry about that. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, my name is Doug Johnson, and I am the project manager for Bus Network Redesign, and I'm joined by my colleague, Robert Guptel, the director of service planning at the MBTA. Uh, before I continue, uh, can someone just confirm that you can, in fact, see what I am sharing? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I will do my best to speak slowly for the sake of I the can interpreters. See it as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I will no, um, to really go with go. the flow. Yeah, just just um, speak normally. It's totally okay. fine. The interpreters will need to keep up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sometimes I talk too fast when I'm giving these presentations. Um, I have a short presentation for you all tonight. If you attended the Riders Transportation Access Group meeting on June 30th, this is the same presentation from that meeting. Um, but really, I'm here to tell you about bus network redesign and what it is. And if anyone has any specific questions about proposed uh, service changes, Robert Guptel from the T will be able to answer any of those questions. And we have maps that we can show that show all of the changes to them proposed changes to the system. So what is the bus network redesign? Uh, hopefully everyone here is already familiar with this process, um, but it is a complete reimagining of the MTA's bus network um, to create a better network that better reflects the travel needs of the region um, and creates a better experience for bus riders. Uh, the reason why we're doing this process is because, as you all know, the region has changed a lot over the last few decades, but our bus network has not. Um, so this is a, a response to those changes and you know, new demand for travel and the creation of new uh, job centers and new destinations in the region that are not necessarily well served by public transit as it is today. The bus network redesign, I'll speak more about it specifically in the next few slides, but I just want to emphasize that it is one piece of a much larger effort at the MBTA to improve bus service, um, improve our facilities, improve the experience of, of using buses, um, and really improve the entire system. So 
we coordinate with other ongoing efforts at the T, including uh, Bus Priority, which um, is an effort to create things like dedicated bus lanes on city streets to make uh, buses more reliable. Um, it's also coordinating with our effort to modernize our bus uh, maintenance facilities and modernize the bus fleet. And it's being coordinated with the ongoing effort to ensure that all bus stops in the MCA system are accessible. The bus network redesign has built off of really years of effort that have preceded it under the Better Bus Project. Um, through the public outreach for the Better Bus Project, what we really heard from our riders was that uh, they need the bus network and transit services in general to go where people want to go. We need a system that is simple uh, to use and, and understand, and a system that is fast, frequent, and reliable, um, and most importantly, serves the people who rely on it most. So what we are trying to do with bus network redesign is really prioritize equity by looking at the needs of folks who are most dependent on public transportation, who need it most, folks who um, don't have access to personal automobiles, um, low income populations, communities of color, seniors, people with disabilities, um, et cetera. And we want to look at the needs of all of those folks and then figure out how to modify the bus network to better serve those people as well as everyone in general. Um, we're looking at having more frequent service in neighborhoods that you know, are the busiest in terms of uh, housing and jobs where travel is happening to and from. Uh, we want more all day service. We want new connections to more places, uh, including non downtown job centers. Um, and in general, a network that's simpler and easier to use. Um, we're paying particular attention to accessibility in the new network. Um, and as folks may already know, um, we have released a proposed draft, draft bus network map, which we can talk about um, in these meetings today. We are soliciting comments on that map from the public who want input from folks. We're going to countless public meetings and in-person events at transit stations and other locations to talk to folks about that proposed map. And we're going to take all the feedback and input that we get and then make revisions to the map before we have what we're calling a final map, which will then move forward into implementation. So as we look at making modifications to what we proposed, um, we are paying particular attention to accessibility needs, including things like uh, distances to nearest bus stops, number of transfers that would be required to make trips, um, crowding on buses and at bus stops, the accessibility of bus stops, and the you know, proximity to um, important destinations, including shopping centers, healthcare facilities, um, senior housing, et cetera. So those are all things that we are trying to keep in mind as we adjust the draft map and finalize it. The proposed map that we have released, um, as it is proposed, would bring high frequency service to 275,000 more residents than the existing network. Um, 150,000 more residents of color would gain access to high frequency service, and 40,000 low income households would gain access to high frequency service. In this case, we're defining high frequency service as service that is every 15 minutes or better all day, seven days a week. Um, we're also proposing a 25% increase across the board in bus service, um, a 70% increase in weekend service. And just as an example of you know, how we're looking at new job centers that didn't necessarily exist in the way they do now, decades ago, um, with the new proposed map, 200,000 more residents would gain access to frequent service to the Longwood Medical Area, where as folks know, a lot of hospitals are located. Um, we are doubling the number of 
high frequency routes in the system. The map on the left hand side of the screen shows the existing 15 high frequency corridors um, that we have today. And the image on the right shows the 30 high frequency corridors proposed under the bus network redesign map. Uh, one thing I want to note on this map on the right is that these are just highlighting high frequency routes. This does not show the lower frequency routes um, that are also part of that proposal um, and complement the high frequency network. Um, right now, with the existing network, 27% of weekday service is frequent. In the proposed network, it's 50% of weekday service. Uh, communities like Everett, Lynn, Bedford, Somerville, South Boston, West Roxbury um, do not currently have frequent all-day uh, routes. Now they would under the proposed map. Um, and just to uh, continue to use the Longwood Medical Area as an example, uh, right now it's only served by two frequent bus routes. In the proposed map, there would now be six. Um, and then Seaport and Kendall Square also get new frequent service that they don't have in the existing system. Um, we are focusing on providing frequent bus service on corridors and uh, to locations that are not served well by the rapid transit network today. Um, I mentioned the number of residents who would gain access by high frequency service to the Longwood Medical Area, sort of in that vein, um, with the proposed map, 180,000 more people would gain high frequency service to the South Boston waterfront, um, and approximately 50 to 60,000 more people would gain high frequency service to the Back Bay and Kendall Square. The, as I mentioned, bus network redesign builds off of you know, years of work under the Better Bus Project, um, including tons of public engagement and collecting feedback from the public um, going back the last few years. Uh, we used all of that feedback that we collected to evaluate the existing bus network and then um, do more public outreach to folks to talk about how transit was currently working or not working for them. We then used that to draft this new bus network map, uh, which we released um, a couple months ago and have been doing extensive public outreach for um, since the spring and through this summer. Uh, so that's what you see here in outreach phase two, uh, summer and spring 2022. We intend to take all of that feedback that we're getting from folks and finalize the map this fall do more public outreach to folks to talk about what changes were made to the map in response to the feedback that we got. And then implementation is anticipated to begin in 2023. And it's expected that we will implement this new network in phases over the course of about five years. Uh, just an example of some of the public outreach that we're doing. Um, I apologize, I should have updated the numbers on the slide because they're a little out of date. We've attended even more meetings and gotten more comments from folks uh, since this slide was originally populated. Um, but we have a survey available on our project website, which folks can fill out. We've been conducting focus groups with riders, um, convening an external task force for the bus network redesign. We've been holding um, meetings with municipalities and roadway owners, um, conducting street team outreach events throughout the network, uh, conducting open houses at different stations, doing engagement with bus operators, the MTA training school, and all of the internal departments at the MTA. Uh, we've given presentations to elected officials, um, and we've been advertising our meetings and this process in multiple languages across uh, multiple forms of media, including radio ads, newspaper, online, et cetera. Uh, so we have a really extensive public outreach process. We really want as many folks as possible to be able to provide input on our draft map um, and help us shape it and make it better. Um, we still have some upcoming public engagement opportunities for folks to attend if they'd like. Um, including on July 19th. So next week, we're going to have an in-person open house at the bowling building in Nubian Square. 
Uh, then we're going to have a virtual public hearing on Zoom on July 26th. And on July 28th, we'll have an in-person public hearing at 10 Park Plaza um, in downtown Boston, where the MTA and MassDOT offices are located. Um, we also have some station open houses coming up. Um, we just did one yesterday at Forest Hills. We have one next week at Wonderland. Um, and then we have a couple more street teams events coming up as well. Uh, tomorrow we'll be at Oak Road disseminating information about Western Art Redesign, talking to riders. And then next week we'll be um, at Ruggles Station. And then later in the week, we will be at Wonderland again to the street team. There are lots of different ways that folks can provide feedback on the Draft Network map. And we're incorporating all of that feedback um, into our <coughs> process for making changes to the network. Um, the, there's a project website that you can go to um, that contains all of the information about the proposed map um, and talks about ways that you can solicit comments on it. Uh, the project website is mbta.com slash BNRD, which is the acronym for West Network Redesign. Um, if you want to learn more about the other efforts that are underway related to Bus Network Redesign, you can find those at mbta.com slash better bus. Um, you can send us emails to the uh, better bus email address, which is better bus project at mbta.com. Uh, we take in all the emails about bus network redesign and review them. Uh, I mentioned the online survey. You can also mail written comments to us if you'd like to. Uh, you can send them to 10 Park Plaza, Suite 3830, Boston Mass 02116. Or we also have a voicemail uh, line set up where you can call in and leave your comments verbally if you'd like to. And the number for that is 617-222-3011. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can provide feedback on this. Uh, we hope that you are able to engage in this process in any way that you can. We'd really love to hear from you, hear your thoughts on the proposals that we have out there uh, so that we can improve them as we finalize them. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to you all for questions and comments. And if you have any comments about specific changes to roots, uh, Robert Guptill from the T would be able to speak to any of those. And I have slides that show maps with those changes. So we're happy to walk through those. OK, thank you very much, Doug. This is Wes. I'm going to ask you to close your PowerPoint presentation now so we can get everyone up on uh, full screen. Thanks. Okay, one moment. Okay, um, actually I do have a question. Um, I wanna actually open it up to the board. Um, I have a question then I'm gonna open it up to the board for any questions. I'm really excited to see this new redesign of the bus network and I think this is a great project. Um, I think it's gonna be very, ch I think it's been pretty challenging over the past two years of the pandemic and I'm just wondering how these changes are gonna, this redesign is gonna impact some of these changes because many companies are not bringing people back to the office full time. So we've seen lots of changes. Um, people are working more frequently in a hybrid mode. So I'm not sure how this is gonna, how you think this might impact this new redesign plan that you have. That is a great question. Um, I think, you know, some of the, changes that we've proposed um, are somewhat unaffected to some extent by what has happened the last couple of years. There are some bus routes that are already back to pre-pandemic ridership or are starting to exceed pre-pandemic ridership. So some of the changes that we make um, will be to improve many of those routes that are already seeing substantial ridership. Um, but also because of the fact that implementation of this network will take a couple of years. Um, I think we'll be able to continuously evaluate changes in travel patterns and see if we need to make modifications to the map as we go through implementation. So to some extent, it will be an iterative process where we can make little adjustments 
um, here or there as circumstances change or ridership um, and travel demands. And I just like to add yes to everything that Doug said. In my department, service planning, we are the department that looks at ridership and looks at crowding, and we continually make adjustments on a quarterly basis to schedules to reflect uh, what that ridership is to try and avoid crowding. The one thing that I would add, uh, you mentioned that travel patterns have changed and people are traveling you know, once a week or twice a week, whereas they used to travel you know, five times a week for those commute jobs. Uh, certainly, this plan reflects with much more service during the midday, much more service on weekends, much more service at night, and a, a flattening out of those peak uh, service patterns that we had pre-pandemic, and much more opportunity for people to have that flexibility that we, they are now demanding for their jobs, for their lifestyles as part of a post-pandemic or you know, we're still in the pandemic, quite honestly, but still you know, how those travel patterns have changed uh, because of the pandemic. Okay, very well, thanks, Robert. Um, thank you both, actually, Robert and Doug. And I actually see, um, I see uh, Jerry has his hand up. I recognize Jerry. This is Andrea Deary, you're muted. There we go, there we go. Uh, thank you for your presentation and thanks Wes for, for recognizing uh, me. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I uh, the board had solicited uh, uh, from members the uh, specific questions on specific routes and I do have a, a, a specific question so I, I don't know if you guys are are prepared to answer specific questions this evening or, or whether we should do that uh, we should do that offline we can try sure um, well I'll use my uh, my question as an example uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the of the meeting I live in West Roxbury um, and and um, I saw from from uh, the map that uh, there'll be more uh, more frequent service in West Roxbury um, and also service to a legacy place uh, my question uh, uh, concerned um, uh, accessibility um, uh, to uh, legacy place, it didn't look like from the materials that I was able to just turn so far. It looked like uh, the, there was going to be a bus route that go, went directly into uh, legacy place, and it, and as you may or may not know, legacy place is off, off a very busy section. Uh, so I, you know, I just want to make sure that you know it's it's good that this going to be uh, extended service to Legacy Place. It's a big shopping plaza and it has a movie theater there and Whole Foods and whatnot, L.O. Bean, so forth. Um, but I also want to make sure that that, uh, that it's going to be accessible for folks uh, with mobility impairments, uh, you know, and safe uh, uh, to people, uh, you know, that they'll be able to access, you know, get to Legacy Place safely. So. How would how would the, um, your initial proposal uh, accomplish that? Thank you very much for that question. So certainly accessibility is a key part of when we provide service. Any new service by federal law has to be fully accessible. So going to Legacy Place as an example, we cannot provide service to Legacy Place unless the stops that we serve are fully accessible according to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, in terms of Legacy Place, we have been actually working with them over the past year to try and find a location where we can uh, serve layover the bus um, and, and provide a good place for uh, service to be. And we've had some good conversations with Dedham, with Legacy Place, it's certainly you know, my hope that we can talk about 
you know, service to legacy place is one of the early implementation uh, things as part of the bus network redesign because we've had some of those conversations already. And if and when we do go to legacy place, I'll just repeat that it will be fully accessible and will really be an improvement upon the situation that exists today where people going to Legacy Place have no choice but to use the 34E and then travel more than a half mile over sidewalks that are not accessible by any generous definition and then crossing that intersection at Providence Highway. Uh, so this will certainly be an improvement that we're very excited to see and we're working very hard to make that happen. Um, yeah, thank you for that. So I end up from what you're saying is that uh, there are ongoing discussions. So as it stands right now, um, your initial proposal would not uh, improve access uh, to Legacy Place that much? I'm sorry, yes, the, the proposal talks about going to Legacy Place. Sorry, did I miss another part of the question there? Yeah, I asked specifically, because from what I was able to discern from the materials so far, it still looked like there was, it's pr uh, pretty hazardous uh, to, to travel to Legacy Place based on the new, based on your current uh, new proposed uh, route. Uh, is that not true? Am I am I reading that incorrectly? Or? So when you look at the draft map, uh, it calls for the routing to go into Legacy Place uh, via Elm Street, and then circle around the area that's just outside the movie theater and the yard house. And the idea would be that we would uh, that would be the stop in the layover position um, for service. So you could oh, so that place from that position. So there, there would be a stop near, uh, near Elm Street. We wouldn't have to cross over uh, Providence Highway. Uh, That's correct. There would be a stop actually in Legacy Place. OK, but, but from what you uh, said earlier to, to my question, you said uh, the, you're, you're still in discussions about where that exactly would be. That's correct. We have a draft proposal that one can see in the map that's available. We are currently working with Legacy Place to find the best location for their needs as well as ours. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before I call on Ducia for her question, I would like to let the members know that um, your feedback can actually be given at the end of the meeting as well because. Um, you're more than welcome to actually write your question in the chat as well. So whether you verbalize it here or put it in the chat, you can certainly do that as well. You can give public input. The public can give input as well anytime in the chat. Okay. Go ahead, Jessia. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Wesley. And uh, Douglas and I'm sorry, Doug and Matt, thank you so much for your presentation. I do have a question. I was looking through your, so I was looking through the, the changes, um, for lack of better wording, I, I saw, I was looking at the change that you made, I think a few weeks ago, don't know anymore right now on top of my head. But anyway, I was looking at the changes and I noticed that, so it's, I don't know, maybe, maybe I was not looking at everything or maybe there was something that I overlooked. However, I noticed that there, were part, there was a part like Arlington, like Arlington or Arlington Heights. Um, I'm not sure if it was a part, is it part of the tree because I haven't known, I, I didn't see it. So like there's the bus um, 63 or a 71, no, not 71, 77. 60 or 77, those bus that goes like, it's like Armand Ar Arlington Heights and a little further up, I think. And I know that area is, I know that area is where usually buses go and it's the weekends are very, let's see, the, the weekends, it's 
hard there. I mean, I, I work there. Um, I do still internship there on the weekends, and I noticed that it's it's not very like it's a little hard for uh, for some people who are in villages or, or other like there are accessibility issues around that area. So I was wondering if the but if the changes are including that route or not yet. I mean, as I said, I don't know. Maybe I didn't. Maybe it's there, but I didn't see it. Thank you. Great questions. Um, and there's so much detail here. It's really hard to get a sense of all of it. Uh, so yeah, in the Arlemont area, we do have a couple routes that serve that, that neighborhood. Uh, the one that directly serves the Arlemont area is the 78. It's draft called the 78, as the 78 is today. Uh, the change that we would actually put, uh, that we're recommending for the 78, is to have it uh, all the time uh, go down to Route 2A, um, the, the way that it, it does sometimes today, but sometimes it goes up to um, Arlington, uh, the, the busway on, on, off of Mass Ave. We would have it full time go down to 2A. Uh, that would be the kind of the thinking of trying to make something do consistent all the time, you know, every day. And this would be service that would operate uh, weekdays, Saturdays, and Sundays uh, on on, um, on Saturdays and Sundays during the day, it would be 60 minutes or better, would be the, the scheduled frequency that we're proposing. Uh, also in that neighborhood, uh, we do have uh, the 62, which is coming from Bedford, and it comes down through Arlington Heights um, on its way to, uh, to 2A. Uh, that would provide some level of service. Um, again, during the weekends, it would be 60 minutes or better that it would provide that service. And then along Mass Ave, we have the 77 uh, as it operates today. And that would be a high frequency service. That would be 15 minutes or better every day, weekday, Saturday, Sunday, from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m., 15 minutes or better. Thank you very much. This is Carl. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Carl. Thank you. So I see <clears throat> um, that you're increasing all these bus routes with more frequency, but I'm assuming you have so many resources. You only have a finite number of resources, so I'm assuming if you're increasing the number of bus routes that you're also decreasing some. Is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the last that we're decreasing? What? So I'm, ass I'm assuming if you're going to be increasing the frequency and the availability of some routes that you have to take away uh, some services from other routes. Uh, so one of the things that Doug mentioned when he was giving this presentation is that this plan represents a 25% increase in service hours. So that being said, we are certainly able to increase the overall level of service that we are providing. However, even with that, there are some trade-offs that are in here uh, that one has to make when you're changing routes and whenever you change a route, even if you're serving the same uh, stop locations, but routes are going in different directions, there are going to be some people who benefit and some people who do not benefit. So th those trade-offs are a natural part of this route level planning. But the overall 25% increase in service hours means that we have many fewer trade-offs than, than we would need to make otherwise. Did I answer your question, Carl? I, yeah, for now you did. I'll have to take a look and see where the trade-offs are. Um, but yes, I think um, overall I'm, I'm very happy with the increased frequency as a, a blind person who relies on the bus system quite a bit. But I'm thinking of routes like, I can't remember the bus number, to go by the Cal Center on the weekend already. It really doesn't go by the Cal Center for the blind or out to Perkins. You know, I'm just, there are certain routes that I'm worried about that may be impacted, and I just have to take a look and see what they are. But overall, I'm thrilled with, with, with what I see of the plan. And if I can speak to the route that you're talking about, Route 52, which today 
operates just for the couple trips on weekdays and does not operate on weekends. Under this plan, it would operate on weekdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, um, so every day. And I don't have the frequencies off the top of my head, but it's at least every 60 minutes or better on all Correct. of those days. Thank you. All right. Okay, any other questions from the committee, from the board? I do see a question right. that came in in the chat. Uh, the question was, is the 32 from Hyde Park being extended to Legacy Place? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, it is the 34 and 34E that are proposed to extend to Legacy Place. The 32 would continue to terminate in Wolcott Square as it does today. But I, I would also like to add, sorry, it's always additional things one can think of. Uh, there is a, uh, an extension of Route 33 that is proposed that would go from Ashmont to Mattapan uh, that would continue through Cleary Square uh, and then continue all the way um, through Dedham, connecting to Dedham Mall. And that would provide the opportunity to transfer to the 34 or 34E to Legacy Place. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you again. Um, I'd like to recognize Matt Warren. I, I see that um, Matt's got a question. He's from the Boston Transportation Department. Hey, everyone. I um, just wanted to thank Rob and um, Doug for the close partnership on this. My name is Matt Moran. I work for the Boston Transportation Department. Uh, we as the intern called the transit team. So we coordinate closely with the T to sort of make sure that the service is reliable and improve bus service across the city. Um, I will leave my contact info in the chat. If people have any Boston specific questions or feedback, we are also putting together a comment letter and um, soliciting sort of, sort of Boston wide uh, comments. So feel free to reach out and let me know if you have any um, questions or feedback. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. Now, I guess um, there's no further questions from the board. One moment, yes. Thank you, so again, thank you, Doug and Rob. Thank you so much. And thanks, Matt, for your uh, contact information there in the chat. All right. I guess uh, next on the agenda, I'm going to proceed with the, looks like it is, right, it's the chair's report. Just give me one moment while I pull up my notes. Okay. So um, there are a few things that I did want to report on. Firstly, uh, May Michelle Wu's inauguration was recently held. It was two weeks ago. And it was attended by many of the advisory board members. And it was really great to see some of you in person after many months. And also it was really great meeting some of your significant others. And I'm also really amazed at the, uh, the dance moves. Um, for those of you who took the dancing floor, you took it like a storm, I was uh, really impressed. I'm not gonna name any names, but those of you who did deserve a round of applause. <laughs> so hooray. Okay, so um, <laughs> yes. So next on my item on my uh, report is the ADA day, which is gonna be taking place at City Hall Plaza. And that's scheduled for next Tuesday, July 19th. And this is a free event. 
There will be local organizations that serve the disability community, and there'll be city departments there on hand to answer questions uh, at the ADA celebration day. There'll also be some music, some t-shirts, and lunch is also gonna be provided, so free food. Pre-registration is not needed, but if you need additional accommodations, please send an email, send, send a contact or an email to the to disability at boston.gov, G-O-V. The event is wheelchair accessible and, and scent free, so no perfumes, and ASL interpreters and CART services have been confirmed for the event. Now, the next item is, one of my favorite local museums is currently looking for disabled participants to provide some feedback on new exhibits. The Museum of Science is seeking individuals and groups that have a range of disabilities who are interested in testing out some new exhibits and programs for accessibility. The testing lasts about 30 to 90 minutes and this also includes a small uh, payment of a stipend and free admission to the museum, the exhibit halls, for the day and also free parking at their garage at the museum. Uh, next item is, well, July is actually Disability Pride Month. And um, I actually didn't know that there was a flag for it, that it was actually created by a woman with a disability. And her name is Anne McGill. And each of the elements on the flag represent some part of the disability. Some of the colors uh, represent different groups. So for example, um, the black field on the flag represents disabled people who have suffered, who've lost their lives due to their disability, have been neglected, or have experienced suicide or eugenics. The red on the flag represents people with physical disabilities. Yellow represents those with cognitive and intellectual disabilities. The white represents those who have invisible and undiagnosed disabilities. And then blue on the flag is for people who have suffered from mental illness. And then lastly, green is for people, represents people who uh, have a sensory perception disability. Okay. And so one last item um, is that I read the social media post on, uh, a social media post on uh, by Coldplay, the musical group Coldplay. And it seems that Coldplay really do care about their fans. And they seem to strive to make their live performances enjoyable for everyone. So what they did was in their post, they shared how they are aiming to heighten the experience for their audience members, specifically for their deaf and hard of hearing fans. They offered the thing called a sub pack, as well as they provide sign language interpreters. And they actually offered the ability to contact them by email um, if they're coming to a city near you. And I did take a look at their site, but unfortunately they're not coming to Boston any, anytime soon. Um, but for those of you who don't know what a sub pack is, there are these wearable devices, they're like a vest that deliver bass sounds. So the feeling of the bass rhythm. Um, so those sub packs, they're, kind of, they're pretty cool actually. I remember before I, uh, the Boston Landmark Orchestra had received a grant. I think it was two years ago. They got a grant for using these sub packs for their performances. Um, and I haven't really seen any event that promotes um, the use of this. So my point is basically that I hope that more concerts in Boston will you know, work on increasing accessibility like what Coldplay is saying that they're doing. They've been doing this for their shows. Okay, so that's the end of my chair's report. Are there any questions?
Okay. I think now, oh wait, I do see one. Go ahead, yep, is that? It's uh, me, Wes. Um, I may have missed this. Thank you for bringing the attention uh, to our attention about the flag. I had no idea. Um, where can where did you see it, or where can we uh, where can we see an example of one, or maybe even get one? Uh, actually, I'd be happy to send any of you the link um, of the Disability Pride flag. There's a link. Um, I can send it to you via email after the meeting if you'd like. That would be great, or, or put it in the chat too. I, I, I would love to, you know, see it and again, see if I can get some sort of representation of it for, for my own personal use. Yes, great, I will do that. I'll certainly do that. Um, I'll do that in a few minutes. Um, my hands are a bit busy, they're a bit tied here, juggling a few things, so I'll do oh, that. Oh yeah, no worries, no worries, thank you. Okay, so thanks, Jerry. And Elizabeth, I think Elizabeth has a comment? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, uh, Wes, for the report, the, your report. But um, in particular, um, in following up with um, the Museum of Science, I don't know if they're, if that's, did you say that's across all types of disabilities? Um, I think you might have, but yeah. also how to follow up on that? Yeah, all disabilities. And how, if people are interested, how do we follow up? Um, one moment. I will look for their email contact and I can put that in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, okay. This is Andrea as well. Uh, Colleen is gonna try and look that up um, while, while you're running the meeting, Wes. So if we can't find it, uh, we'll let you know before the, before the end of the meeting. Great, thank you so much, Andrea, I appreciate it. All right, Paul, you had a comment? Did you, was there something you wanted to say, Paul? No, I didn't. I must have, the mute must have been off on it, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, thank you, though. Any other, <clears throat> any other questions about the chair's report? Okay, seeing none then, <clears throat> now <clears throat> it's time for us to uh, have our board member spotlights. And I've asked Elizabeth, and hopefully she'd be willing this evening. Uh, so thank you so much for being willing this evening. Elizabeth? Uh, yes, um, thank you, Wes. Um, I, didn't have an, I didn't have an opportunity to let you know directly that I'd be able to participate, but um, uh, yes, I'll, I'll keep this, um, brief, but uh, what I'd like the board and the public to know about me is that um, uh, I'm Elizabeth Dean Clower. I'm a public health doctor by training. Um, it so happened that my medical school training coincided with my experience of a uh, chronic condition that became uh, a disability. So I, it was definitely uh, both an interesting challenge as well as uh, insightful for me to have my own experience, a lived experience with a disability coincide with being trained in a situation that um, often was inadequate uh, to um, in considering uh, the, um, the situations or need for accommodations for many disabilities. Now, in fairness, because of uh, the timing, part of um, part of this occurred before the ADA was passed, but not by that that much time. I would say the more significant um, time frame that I've had uh, a disability has been with the ADA in place, and certainly we've all seen the improvements. But there there need to uh, be more um, professionally. I worked in cancer care settings for 20 years. 
uh, working with, um, not as a clinician, but as doing some research and education um, and working with uh, clinicians. Uh, I, as far as advocacy, um, I, because I was first working down at the National Institutes of Health, I was working on some of the uh, local or Washington-based um, advocacy work with, within uh, um, the federal government, but at a much earlier stage um, relative to where that is now. But um, I grew up in this area, wanted to return to this area, and so um, when I moved back to Massachusetts, I was on the other side of the river in Cambridge and participated in their um, commission for um, the Cambridge Commission for Persons with Disabilities um, as a member and chair. And but certainly have enjoyed working in once I moved to Boston that this is uh, the both the size of Boston and great you know greater uh, even greater diversity resources uh, um, and uh, interrelated issues governmentally that I realized that this um, both uh, the commissioner's office on disability and then our advisory board that there these um, uh, reports that we receive these presentations we hear from so many other parts of city government um, are just a reminder of how interrelated many of these problems are. Um, so I uh, and so I have continued to do some teaching at uh, Tufts University School of Medicine. I have done a little bit of spot teaching over at UMass Medical School in Worcester, but um, uh, have enjoyed also um, working as a member of the executive board and the arrived subcommittee chair of the um, RTAG, uh, which stands for Riders Transportation Access Group. Um, a number of you have attended some of their general meetings, and I'd like to discuss with the executive board about having um, that office that's responsible for the ride come and give a presentation to our group. Um, and so just to finish out uh, uh, my uh, overview of myself, um, I really enjoyed traveling in the past that um, in addition to the, the way COVID challenged everyone's uh, ability to travel, that for some medical reasons, I haven't been able to travel as I had in the past, but um, had enjoyed both uh, attending a medical conference in China in the past and was the only, one of the only people I saw in a wheelchair the whole time in a, a two week trip and in, in many well populated areas. Um, so it's as much as we still feel there's a long way to go in the U.S. It, uh, it's a reminder that we do have access that, that some other places don't have. And that I was able to attend um, the Paralympics um, in 2012 in London um, as a, a spectator. And I am a sports fan. So with that, I, 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 the only thing I would add um, that as um, Wesley had already referenced, it was so great to see a number of you at the um, uh, inaugural event for um, Mayor Wu. It, was, it made me realize how much I had missed our in-person contact. So thanks. Okay, thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Elizabeth, for sharing your story. Very impressive background that you have. I actually uh, I do have a follow-up question, if you don't mind. Sure. Is there... Is there some specific association for, for medical prov uh, professionals who, uh, with disabilities? Is there some sort of a professional association that you're, that you're aware of? 
Um, that's that's a good question. That um, I there certainly have been ones that I, I actually need to look into that to see where things stand now because what also changed in the ADA versus um, that that what existed prior to that is that um, that that allowed people who already had disabilities to attend medical school and practice um, in their field. And I think they're probably, I happen to be affiliated with the family medicine department or um, one of the uh, first year, um, like a multi-curricular uh, one at Tufts. But it's an excellent question and, and I'll, I'll come back and I'll let you know because I, I think there are several, not only for medical education these days, but also for, um, or at least, let's put it, let me put it this way, it might be a, not a whole distinct group, but there are, um, there, there are such groups, and I just, um, off the top of my head, don't, don't know uh, a complete list, but I think that's um, a, an excellent question, and I, I'll, I'll find out. But I would say in settings I've worked in, I've, I haven't, it hasn't um, brought me into direct contact with, um, let's say at a conference, with people who have a, a shared disability, but people like Dr. Lisa Iazzoni, um over at Harvard Medical School or Dr. Sherry Blawett, the two-time marathon winner who is over at the Brigham doing sports medicine. These, these are just a couple of examples of people um, who happen to be in wheelchairs. But I thank you for asking the question and I'll, I'll look into it and get back to the group. Great, okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Are there any other questions for like, us? No, they'll do fine, but they're all to a Yeah, I was here last year and they did that. All right. Let me repeat what I was just saying. Are there any other questions for Elizabeth before we move on to the next item on the agenda? Um, Wes, I just have one note myself while um, we find out if anyone had a question. And that's just that um, I just need to let the group know that I won't be able to stay for the entire duration of the meeting tonight. I see, okay, thank you, not a problem. Thank you. Okay, then, um, the next item on the, on the agenda, moving on, is the commissioner's report. And so I'd like to hand the floor to Andy Patton on behalf of the commissioner. Thank you, Wes. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, my name is Andrea Patton. You all know me um, if you're on the board, uh, but to introduce myself to members of the public. Um, oh, I know that says June 15th, but this is definitely the July 13th. Uh, board link. Um, Commissioner McCosh sends her regrets that she is unable to attend this evening. Um, this will be a pretty quick presentation since I am not the commissioner, uh, but a few things that she wanted to make sure um, were made, um, made aware to you. The first, in terms of an advisory board update, uh, the Massachusetts Office on Disability will be having a regional commission on disability meeting. Uh, so any member of a disability commission, and I know it's confusing here in Boston where we use the name commission to describe the city department and advisory board to describe you all. Um, but per state law, you are technically a commission for the purposes of this presentation. Um, and so if you are interested in attending the regional meeting to uh, hear from the state and to meet with other folks who like you are residents in their community who've been appointed to a board. Um, that is happening on July 20th, so next Wednesday, uh, the day after our ADA Day celebration. There's still time to sign up to attend. Um, uh, the email is listed here, Jeff Dugan, J-E-F-F -F dot D-O-U-G-A-N at mass.gov. I believe it is on Zoom, although it doesn't say that here. I can triple check if you have uh, concerns. But Jeff would definitely know if you email him. 
Quick update on our shared spaces in the city outreach campaign, which I know we've been given some exciting updates on the last few months now that we have a um, consultant on board to do the marketing. We held uh, focus groups last week to hear from members of the community about what kinds of messaging is needed, is going to be uh, productive and helpful and, and things like that. So we're now working on actually designing our outreach materials with our consultant. With that in mind, our consultant uh, would like to host a photo shoot on July 26th for any members of the community, cyclists, people with disabilities, people who fit both of those um, categories uh, who would like to participate uh, to attend. It would also be 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and I can give more details about the kinds of things they're interested in if you would like to attend, but it would include video, uh, still photography, or just quotes and uh, written stories, although you wouldn't have to attend the photo shoot if you just want to share your story. Um, so please email me, uh, or I should say email Colleen, but either way, email disability at boston.gov to let us know if you'd like to attend. And this is open not just to board members, but to anyone else who is on the call tonight that would like to attend. Um, let us know if you're interested and we can connect you. Wes hit a lot of the great uh, important details about ADA Day, like there will be food and t-shirts. Um, but I also want to mention specifically to the advisory board um, that the tour that was promised uh, near completion of the redesign will be happening. Um, that'll be right at noon. So if you would like to attend that on behalf of the board, um, please let me know so that I can give them a head count. Um, you can just shoot me a quick text, uh, but also please be there shortly before noon, actually, so that we can meet with the construction staff to do that tour. As a reminder, um, for those of you who may not recall, uh, when they came to present to the board, when the city's design team came to present and discussed how we would, in fact, be keeping brick as a design element, uh, albeit very different brick from what existed before, uh, the city did promise to give you all a tour of said brick around completion of the project and again in a year to check on the maintenance. So this is that tour. Please text me or email me if you want to be on that tour so I can give them a head count and please arrive before noon so that we can kick off right at noon. I just quickly wanted to follow up on this from last month's report. Uh, the first of these Open Streets events took place last Sunday uh, in my home neighborhood, Jamaica Plain, on Center Street. Uh, 1.4 miles of Center Street was closed to car traffic and opened to pedestrians and cyclists. Um, there was music, food, games, uh, there were resource tables. I staffed our table and got to meet I don't even know how many people, 50, 75 people probably came to our table, and that's so many more <laughs> than I think I've ever talked to in one day. Um, and it was great. We, we saw some old friends, folks uh, that are on the call tonight stopped by, um, and also met a lot of new people who came up and said, wow, I didn't know you existed. Please tell me more. I'm going to call and follow up. Uh, we had at least one person who came up and said, um, you know, I've, I've been bad at asking for help, but I need to recognize that I, you know, have a disability and join the community. What can I do? Um, and gave her some information. Um, we had some folks who came up and said, I've never, I've been able to, you know, go up and down the street with all of my friends. We all have mobility devices and the sidewalk's not wide enough for all of us to hang out together. This is so awesome to be in the street together. Um, you know, and we heard about some broken sidewalks and things that need fixed, so we took down some addresses um, and really, all in all, it was just a really fun day. Um, it was good to be out. There are two more of these events happening, one uh, in Grove Hall in, in Dorchester, and that's August 6th, and one in September down in Mattapan. So we're learning from some of the accessibility challenges as well as the accessibility wins that took place in Jamaica Plain so that we can improve and make these events uh, really fun for everyone in Dorchester and Mattapan. So let me know if you were there and you just missed me. Um, and if you have any feedback, we'll make sure we, we incorporate it uh, to the teams in Dorchester and Mattapan. 
Lastly, I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of a new opportunity for feedback, this time from the federal government. The US Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy is speak seeking information from the public. Um, so the current population survey is a survey that is run by the Department of Labor and the Census Bureau. They collaborate on this. So while the census itself only takes place every 10 years, um, the current population survey takes place more regularly than that. And they have various supplemental questions that uh, dig in deeper than what the census does. And one of those things is labor force statistics. This is the primary source for the US government about labor. And they are looking for some feedback uh, from the public about the supplement related to disability policy, or disability employment, I should say. Um, so yes, Wes, I saw your, your note to drop these links in the chat, and I absolutely will do that. Um, I don't believe there is, there is a deadline. It's some significant time away. It's not like in two days. Um, but I will check that and put that in the chat as well when I drop the links. And I believe, yes, that is all that I have. Happy to take any questions that I can answer or write them down and get them to Kristen if you have questions for the commissioner. Thanks. Wes, I guess uh, it's silent, so there are no questions. Thank you very much, Andrea. And so next, moving on on the agenda, the architectural access full update is going to be given by Commissioner. Gary, oh, I'm sorry, hi, hi Wes, um, this is Patricia. Um, this month we were going to skip my report. Oh, okay. That's fine. Thanks for letting me know. I just actually, I didn't pull up the agenda. Hold on. <laughs> All right, so next on the agenda, we have uh, any announcements? Does anyone on the board have any announcements to share? Okay, uh, seeing in the chat. That's just me, Andrea. Wes. This is Andrea. Um, those are the links about the Census Bureau survey and the comments do close uh, August 8th, so you've got some time. Okay, yeah, I see these comments in the chat. Thanks, Andrea, great. All right, then I guess then there are no other announcements, so we're gonna proceed and we're gonna move to old business. Just give me a moment. All right, so uh, this is related to the outdoor dining advocacy letter that we drafted. So first of all, I do want to say uh, thank you, Jerry, for assisting with the letter draft. Now, we've modified the letter, and we wanted to get uh, this feedback on the letter, and I know that there was maybe an issue related to the flash, flush patios and the bridge plates, so the uh, flush patios and the bridge plates. And so I had suggested that they really use the, uh, the flush plates, flush patios, I'm sorry, because I, I thought that that would be convenient, I guess, but I actually wanted to hear the board's thoughts on this issue before the letter is finalized and we send it over to the mayor's office. So any thoughts from the board? Flush patios, bridge plates? 
I just had, oh, this is a question, Wes, this is Jerry. I haven't seen any revised drafts, uh, you know, um, uh, has that gone out and did I just miss it or? Yeah, um, I did, let me add, um, all I did was uh, add the recommendation for flush patios to the letter. Okay. And I recommended that they do that over the option of the bridge plates where they can. And I just wonder what people think about that recommendation. This is Andrea. Um, it was, I can dr drop a link in the chat. Uh, it was also um, included in the email that I sent on Monday with the agenda. Um, but let me drop a link in the chat. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll no take worries. a look. E either, either place is fine. Um, I'm not uh, that well versed on the difference between the two items, so I don't know if Patricia can can give us a two second uh, primer on it or, or someone can. Hi, Jerry, I haven't had the chance to um, to look at the, the draft. Sorry. Okay, so let me just, um, I was planning to explain just a little bit about what I meant, so I'll do my best to describe the difference. Um, I know that um, there's, they're requesting a bridge plate, and I know we sort of understand what a bridge plate is. So if you're trying to get down a ramp, for example, um, it's like a temporary ramp. But a flush patio is really, uh, it's, it's a type of um, set up where the sidewalk is completely flush with the patio, so at the same level. So there's no need for a ramp or a bridge plate or anything. It's just flush, flush level. That's the difference between the two strategies. Okay, so. Um, This is Andrea. Um, I know we don't necessarily want to postpone a vote on this. I think Olivia was the one who had suggested come um, language about the bridge plate, um, and she's not here today, so I don't know if that's, maybe that's why no one else has a comment. Um, I'm trying to think if we could um, make a vote pending, I'm not sure if we could, um, pending further, you know, that would be a pretty significant change if Olivia has concerns. Um, I did drop a link in the chat though if anyone else wants to read it. Okay, so again, this is Wes. I can give the board a few minutes to take a quick look at the letter. Um, and then share any sort of initial thoughts. So I can hold for a few minutes while you do that. Okay.
All right, this is Wes. I'm not sure if anyone has, if you've had the chance to read the letter, but uh, let me share my thoughts about this. Actually, my thoughts about the flush patio versus the bridge plate um, is really, um, I don't have the perspective of someone who's a wheelchair user, but I've heard from other wheelchair users about this issue. This feedback I think is really important. And so the reason why I'm suggesting this is because just to let you know, I live in the North End and many of the restaurants have very small sidewalk areas where they've got their tables. And there's not a lot of space for people to navigate. And with the bridge plates, it takes up um, the restaurant's space in that area. So in this way, I think I'm not really, I think this would give a little bit more of the options for all of the people involved. So this is just sort of the thinking that I'm having about this based on what people have shared with me who are wheelchair users, but I would like to know other people's thoughts. Uh, this is Andrew. I see Patricia has got a comment. Warren, um, yeah, so now now I understand um, better the question that Jerry um, asked me before. So uh, the, the bridge plate is the same as the portable ramp, like the metal piece. Um, so now I understand the, the question better. And I, I agree that the flush condition of a parklet is a much, much better option for outdoor dining. Um, the problem with a portable ramp is it, it's a it's a less it's like a temporary solution that uh, we thought of for the pandemic, but it, the the flush condition it, it's a superior superior option. 100% agree. Thank you, Fisha. And I see Elizabeth, go ahead. Yes, I'm glad it did work out to stay on for the meeting. Um, uh, I totally agree that that's um, preferable to have it be flush. I have no sense of how many restaurants would fall into the category or at least invoke that they don't have the necessary spacing. And I don't know if there's any, if, if there's been any survey or if we have any data or, or information on, uh, I, mean, I, I guess I, I can see that there might be, it might be necessary to include an exception, but I, I don't know, I don't know how many businesses that already would include, or how many would might too readily fall back on. We don't have another option when, uh, actually, perhaps they did. And I think it's an important topic. This is Andrea. Um, I. I don't necessarily want to, well, I definitely don't want to speak for Olivia, um, but one of the pieces that we had added in the letter, or I had added in the letter, I should say, about requiring a bridge plate when a flush patio can't be achieved due to irregular curb heights, well, what I'd been thinking there is we've seen restaurants that build patios that is flush with the curb for four of the feet, but then because the curb height changes, it's maybe half an inch, maybe an inch, at the rest of the curb, not enough that we would require a full portable ramp, but enough that that's going to create a barrier for a lot of folks. Um, and so while, as you heard from Patricia, our office's opinion is that a flush patio is the ideal condition and, in, and everyone should make an effort to achieve that, um, I just want to comment that we added the bullet of if that can't be achieved for the full patio because of 
your regular curb heights, that's something that can like bridge that gap at least a little bit um, so that wheels aren't getting stuck on the inch or, or stuck in a gap between the patio and the curb, um, that that's when we should require a bridge plate if we can't actually make the full patio flush, if that makes sense. That's what I was going for, but if that's not clear, then I either need to check with Olivia <laughs> or make some edits based on y'all's feedback. Okay. Thank you, Andrea, again, this is Wes. Um, I'd like to add uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's comment about, actually, I don't really, That exact data. Oh. I don't have the exact data, um, but I can tell you that I see many restaurants in the North End, um, and some of them do have their patios um, somewhat flush, but many of them are not even. And there's two restaurants in particular in the North End that I think it's they've got the perfect flush patio and I think those two restaurants are excellent examples um, for what other restaurants should do I'm not gonna name the restaurants but you know this is what I've seen <laughs> so anyway that's sort of my point on this and this is probably the best solution uh, especially in the North End because you know it's very it's very busy there in the summer. Okay. So, uh, Jerry, I see your hand. Yes, thank you, Wes. Um, and you know, I do. I did look at the at the letter just now uh, that that you gave us time to look at it, and I, I, you know, wholeheartedly support um, uh, this draft, and and uh, and you know, and I do agree too that uh, of course. Uh, we want, uh, you know, everyone to use um, uh, flush patios uh, when, when, you know, ever possible. But I'm also concerned, like Elizabeth uh, said, that, that, that there may be restaurants who, who you know, try to get out of uh, that requirement. But I also know that we don't want, um, we don't want our feedback or we don't want the program to be punitive. We want as many restaurants as possible to participate. Um, you know, so I, uh, so long story short, again, I wholeheartedly support uh, the draft letter. Um, obviously, you know, it'll need to be cleaned up for, you know, spacing and, and all that, but I'm sure, you know, Andrea or, or other staff can, can take care of that. But um, I don't know, do we need a vote or, what are you looking for uh, from us at this point, Wes? Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, I'm going to hold before we discuss the voting bit, but um, Jerry, you made a good point about the challenges for restaurants. They may not want to do this, and I, I totally understand that. And I can understand that because, as I said, in the North End, they require you they pay the city a fee, I guess. Um, very different from other neighborhood restaurants. They don't have to pay this particular fee. So anyway, it's a long, there's a long story behind all of that. But I can see why it would be a hardship for some of the restaurants the owners to uh, pay this uh, excessive fee, or to pay for the expense. I'm sorry for the, the flush patio. Um, the city of Boston. Uh, they have to figure that out what they're going to do, maybe give them some sort of an incentive to adhere to this question, I'm not sure. However, um, I do want to propose to Andrea that maybe suggest that maybe we wait for Olivia to give some feedback on this draft because I think it's very important. And so let me suggest then that someone can reach out to Olivia and get her thoughts on this. And then maybe we can do some sort of a, I suppose maybe an online vote once we get her feedback on that. Um, we could do an online vote 
and then this is Carl. We can move forward with the letter. Yeah. I, I would like to make a recommendation that we go ahead and get Olivia's feedback, that we go ahead and vote tonight, assuming that Olivia's uh, suggestions will be friendly to the purpose of the letter, and we go ahead and say that we vote to send a letter out upon Olivia's approval. That way we don't, um, because I believe that we have to um, do the vote. Okay. Due to That's the fine. meeting, uh, the rules of the meeting. I don't know. I, I just would like to get this out sooner than later. So I would like to vote that we get a little bit of feedback <laughs> and then we approve the letter to go out. This is Wes. Um, great. Yes, thank you very much. I think um, I would support, I'm supportive of, of what this, what you're suggesting. So what would we like to do? This is Andrea. Um, just want to chime in real quick and say, Carl's right that if we took a vote in some other fashion, we'd have to publicly notice it 48 hours. That said, I have written down a motion to vote to approve the letter incorporating any amendments Olivia makes that are friendly to the purpose of the letter. Um, so if she wants to gut half of it, um, you know, the, those won't be incorporated, uh, but clarification of the purpose of the bridge plate or something like that, anything that is friendly to that purpose uh, will be incorporated and sent, and I will send you all a copy of those amendments um, before delivering it to the fifth floor. You said that much better than I just did, thank you. No, you did great, Carl. I, um, so is that, is that the motion? Uh, yeah. On the so you want to second it, Jerry, right? I'll second it, yes, this is Jerry. Uh, okay, so all in favor, in favor say aye. 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 Elizabeth? Aye. I said Great. aye. Great. Thank you. I know um, Alice had to leave the meeting. However, I want to make sure that the quorum still applies. Does it, Andrea? Yes, we had a quorum actually before she hopped in, so we still have a quorum now that she's hopped off. OK, all right. <laughs> Good. Ooh, all right, great. Thank you all. I'm really excited to see um, so really this, this change made in the letter. So hopefully you know, it will officially be submitted. Um, let's see. Now, I think um, we can move on to new business. <clears throat> and what I have for new business, I just have two items. One is um, related to the meeting structure and community engagement. I think firstly, um, I think I want to focus on the meeting structure. I want to kind of get a pulse from the advisory board on what you think is working, what may be not be working during the meetings. I think that'll be really helpful to me um, for change to the future. For example, I think it would be helpful possibly to have, um, you know, online voting, that would be nice, but um, it might be helpful, first off, to be having perhaps just one presentation rather than two. Before we've had two or three, and I think I would like to see the board spend more time engaged in some form of discussion about possible policy changes. And I'm just wondering, I'd like to see what your thoughts are on that approach. Um, and anything related specifically to the meeting agenda structure that might need to be changed. So I'm open to those comments. This is Carl. What I couldn't agree with you more on the number of presentations. I think that would be not, the presentations are important, but if we keep it to one or two at the most, never three. Um, we can have more time to do 
Timmy uh, Benson. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Elizabeth. Uh, yes, I also very much support um, making sure that the number of presentations, um, one is preferable, you know, two, depending on um, how, um, you know, it, some combination of the importance of the topic, the detail of the topic, but I think it's hard as, this time of day, especially for, but with, there, it does get to be presentation fatigue. Yeah. no matter what, what the presentation is. And also, um, I have been in um, settings, as I've referenced earlier, where there was even th things like policy changes. There was more of a, uh, an active um, or, or an, on, an ongoing working discussion. We certainly have done that on some topics or, you know, in response to a letter, but that um, recognizing the open meeting laws that uh, so that because sometimes I know that things like even forming subcommittees got a little tricky uh, um, in, in that regard but even if it's a topic to be discussed in in the timing during the meeting I don't know if that's what you had in mind Wes as part of policy changes or if that's a different interpretation yes yep yep that is what I yeah I, I find that kind of a working meeting I mean that sense of more actively trying to, um, or on, a, a more, on a more ongoing basis, I guess I would say, to carve out some time during the meeting, knowing folks' schedules are so busy, that is devoted to s certain specific topics. Um, I, I, I would very much support that, for, you know, change in structure. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. I do want to follow up uh, on your comment. So you're meaning really there are two ways. The first way is that we could make policy changes that would be impactful to the disability community and the general population, general community. And then secondly, the bylaws perhaps, um, I don't know, the bylaws or the open meeting rules, maybe we could make some sort of change if necessary to that's another way that we could probably do this. Um, but again, I'm open to thoughts on that. Um, this is Andrea. Now, um, do, you, do you see a pet? I just Sorry. wanted to say that I can look at open meeting law regulations for subcommittees. I don't know if they have to do the 48 hours and have public input, that sort of thing. Um, so I can look into that and then get that question answered because I just don't know. Um, and in terms of a working meeting, uh, we have enough computers here, as I'm sure you saw, I'm here twice, um, that I'd be happy to sort of be the scribe on a Google Doc if, if you want to do more, like let's write the letter today so that, um, yeah, I'm happy to support that if that's where the board wants to go. Sorry to jump in before Ducia. It's all good, Andrea. Uh, thank you very much, Wesley. I am, so I'm going to say, so let me backtrack. So I personally am flexible regarding the presentations. Uh, they are important, but they all, like there is value in, in all the presentations, definitely. But I personally am flexible as to how many presentations there are. However, I am definitely interested about the policy topics. Uh, so about the policies, I'm definitely interested in that uh, because there's just so many things that we want, that we as a board want to discuss and talk about and see how we can, what we can do to improve um, the policies for people with disabilities in Boston. So I'm definitely on board with that. I'm not quite sure exactly. I think, I think Elizabeth already uh, clarified that when she was asking me questions. So I'm definitely on board with talking about the policies and what we can do to improve. Yes, I'm on board. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I want to figure out what the priority should be because, you know, we are the board members, but we have a board meeting every month, and it's just two hours, which isn't a lot of time. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we all sort of have this benefit um, 
for the community. We can do work that benefits the disability community in Boston. It's effectively possible. Um, okay, so go ahead. Uh, I think Jerry. Jerry. Great. Thanks again, Wes, and thanks for uh, bringing up uh, this topic. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see um, I'd like to see uh, these meetings with more engagement from the public as well. Um, you know, since I've been on the on the board, um, you know, this is my middle of my second term, so almost uh, almost uh, six years uh, on the board. I've seen you know public uh, participation decline. Um, you know, at various times. So I'd like to try to figure out a way that, that we can get more public engagement, um, not just at, at the yearly um, uh, community uh, community forum that we have, which was well attended uh, this year. I was there in person, but I'd like to see uh, these meetings be, these uh, monthly meetings be well attended by the by the public as well. So I don't know if we can put together a survey or, or somehow to get a pulse from the, from the community, uh, um, you know, how, how we can best meet their needs. And I, I you know, I, and I've thought about the idea in the past of maybe having more meetings in the community um, as well. So I don't know if that's something that, that we want to, you know, work on as well. I don't always, I don't, necessarily have answers to these questions yeah. it's just that you know I'd like us to, to think about them yeah yeah Jerry I I think that's actually the second part of um, the new business so that's a good segue uh, community input right getting more community input I guess um, this is really great but I think there's plenty of room. I think these meetings are really great, but there's plenty of room for improvement, of course, and we wanna make sure that we have additional public um, input. And we wanna make, a, I guess, and make sure that the effort's being made so that we can be open to other perspectives as well. So I'm open to any other perspectives on this. This is Andrea, just want to note that there is a comment of the chat um, from a former Quincy board member um, who always had five to 10 minutes of public input at the end of meetings. Don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, um, we tend to hold the public um, input for the end of our board meetings. We do have that. But sometimes we do have input, sometimes we don't have input. So I think we maybe need to do something a little bit beyond that to, to, to promote more public input or something. This is Andrew again. To Jerry's suggestion of a survey, um, as with the letters and other things, we're always happy to uh, be the one to create the link and, and type up all your notes if you have questions you wanna ask certainly something that can be put out in our newsletter, um, you know, but happy to also collaborate with you all on getting the word out among your networks. Maybe there are people you know who don't get our newsletter um, who might want to join, uh, so happy to collaborate on that if that's a direction the board wants to go. Okay, thank you, Andrea. I guess then um, we've collected some really good thoughts and some perspectives this evening on these issues. And so I'm assuming that we, we should be able to get some more, um, we should be able to incorporate some of these suggestions as well to, to focus on this. So thank you all. All right. So hopefully then um, we're gonna go on now to the next item on the agenda. And that is, of course, the uh, under new business. I want to talk about the remote, um, I guess the other issue related to remote uh, meetings. So 
So as many of us uh, know, we, we've kind of liked, enjoyed this approach to having these remote public meetings. And the board, the executive board has had some discussions around this and we're thinking that it might be best if we could create some form of a letter for the state legislators and maybe make a request for a change in the open meeting law. And we would like to make sure that all of the open meetings, public meetings, are inclusive, as, as inclusive as they can be, with options for ongoing virtual format as well, maybe hybrid. And so we'd like to see if there's maybe a way to improve the uh, open meeting law related to this as it impacts our work. So maybe Carl, um, maybe Carl, you might actually have some guidance for us regarding this. And if you do, I, I'd really appreciate that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor to gather some thoughts on this item. Should we create some kind of a letter that we send to the legislators to consider this? Does anyone want to make a comment or make an in per do, do people want to come back to in-person meetings at the city hall? Yeah. You all are on board with that? I, I will update on that note. Um, for our specific board, as far as I know right now, technically the pandemic era amendments, uh, like executive order amendments that allow all of us to be remote end on Friday. The legislature is considering another temporary extension of those temporary allowances for the rest of the year. Um, we did vote to meet mostly remotely as long as one person is in present and we're allowed to do that as a disability commission. Um, but a lot of other public boards and, and um, public meetings of city and state governments aren't gonna be allowed to do that unless there's a permanent change. Um, and will only have the option of doing it and maybe they won't choose to do it. Um, so we're theoretically set um, as a commission, as a disability commission. Um, of course, I'm monitoring all the state, <laughs> state legislation as it comes out. Jerry? Yes, thank you, Wesley. Um, I'm a bit confused, I guess. Um, I know that there's uh, advocacy going on, uh, you know, with the state to make, you know, open, uh, you know, open meetings, you know, virtual open meetings permanent. But I thought the city, uh, there was something, an ordinance um, being floated or, or the city was kind of in a different place. Am I incorrect in that, Andrea, based on what you're, what you're saying that, that the, uh, that they were, uh, that the city was also going by the, the, the state. Um, but I thought there was some advocacy around, you know, trying to get the city to, to also, uh, go to permanent virtual, uh, meetings, uh, uh, you know, if possible as well. Great question, Jerry. Um, so, there's, there's sort of, I'm trying to make this a, a simple because my brain likes to complicate things. Um, there's what we're allowed to do under open meeting law, and by we I mean public meetings people, the Air Quality Control Commission, the Landmarks Commission, et cetera. Um, we have some additional flexibility as a disability commission, which on the one hand is great, uh, but that's assuming people with disabilities don't care about historical landmarks or air quality, which as we all know is not true. Um, the city is abiding by the state law um, that currently allows for remote attendance, but assuming that that goes away, everyone has to come back in person. Even assuming it doesn't go away, if the state decides to extend this forever, likely it would be an option. So for example, I, I think some folks have read the headlines that the governor's council, when they no longer had to, stopped broadcasting their meetings and with sustained public advocacy came back online and started streaming it. 
So I think the issues here are the legal issues of whether or not folks are allowed to offer remote participation in their meetings, which is still an open question post continually extending this temporary thing. Then there's a question of who's gonna actually do it. But first, I think Wes is referring to that legal issue of can they? Um, and technically right now we only can under temporary extensions um, related to the pandemic. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, although, uh, you know, I do know that, you know, we've always, since I've been on the board, we've always offered, um, you know, we've always broadcast them and, uh, and people have always been able, people of, of the public have always been able to participate by calling in if they choose. So I'm still, I guess I'm still a little confused. Yeah. I'd also like to add, this is Wes, that if we were to draft a letter, it would be to, I guess, convince, well, maybe not convince, but to propose the idea to the legislators that we can um, be effective doing virtual public meetings and there's a reason for it. We can give the example. You know, I, we found that the virtual meetings are actually very inclusive. Um, much, maybe more so than the, the in-person meetings. And so, but I don't know if there's other examples of justifications that we could add to this letter, but um, anything that, um, any other benefits to having these um, remote public meetings, you know, would be helpful. Um, I mean, we could have, I think we'd have the option of having in-person and virtual, but I'm sure there are other examples that you might have. So, um, I mean, it saves having to run, in person to get to a meeting on time, you know, the commute time and all of that, um, all of that, the logistics. This is Andrea. For the sake of time, I mean, I defer to Wes on going, going over time, um, but I can prepare a few, um, I can send a few links uh, to let the board know what is going on, what the status is of legally allowed virtual meetings versus just who's choosing to engage in them. Um, and, and I'm happy to, to share more educational resources um, to prepare for a future meeting. Okay. So should we then suggest make a suggestion of a letter, or maybe hold that to the next meeting, the next next business meeting? I think we can hold this as old business. There's no need to take a vote while it's still just a, an issue under discussion. Okay, great. All right then, so uh, again, um, I'm gonna move on the agenda then in the interest of time. So now is the time for public input. So do we have any members of the public who'd like to give input to the meeting? I see someone, is someone, I don't see any, um, Carl, is Carl here? No? Okay, so if Carl's not here, then who's going to make the motion? Does someone want to say something in lieu of Carl saying something? Uh, this is Jerry. this is Jerry. I'll be happy to uh, make the motion in in, in Carl's stick. Uh, I'll be happy to make the motion. This is Jerry. Um, I move, I move to adjourn the meeting. Okay, who would like to second that? Here's Juicy, I second. Okay, great. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So it seems that the meeting is now adjourned. It's adjourning at 7.29. Thank you all uh, for your time and have a very good evening. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.